the written Torah was the written Torah for all times. Yeah. Now, Talmud, it has expanded. Mm -hmm. And what saddens me about that is not that everything in the Talmud is, is not true. Much of it is beautiful, but there's much of it that is not true. Hey friends, if you're Jewish and watching this, you've probably heard the word Torah many times over the course of your life. But what exactly is Torah? Is it the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch? Is it the Sinai Covenant? Or is it the Oral Torah and its accompaniments? Well, today my special guest, Carol Joseph, Masters in Missiology with an emphasis on Jewish studies, is here to clear this up and answer this very question. Hey Carol, it's really great having you here. I'm really enjoying this conversation. Me too. Yeah, and I can't wait to dive into today's topic. And it's one that I've been studying a lot lately, and that is the Torah. Um, what What is it really? And have people really been following um, man-made tradition instead of the Word of God? So let, let's get into that. Um, you know, I, I've heard a lot that, that when people here in Israel, especially when they say Torah, they don't necessarily mean what I think Torah is. is. That's yeah, true. yeah. Yeah. The Torah has become a generic term that basically embraces all of Jewish teaching. Mm. However, in its in its basic sense, the, the word Torah refers to the five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The rest of the Hebrew scriptures is called the Tanakh, which means the Torah, the prophets, and the writings the Tanakh, you know, it's the, it's a, the beginnings of the, of each of those three words in Hebrew. And so that is the Hebrew scriptures. Beyond that, people talk about the Talmud. Now the Talmud has its roots in a tradition, some of which existed in the days of Jesus as the traditions of the elders. When you read in the New Testament, which I find interesting that Jesus mostly took up, took offense or objected to the traditions of the elders when they would become more binding on the people than he than the law ever intended. But we'll get back to that. Yeah. But so the Talmud was written between two hundred and five hundred years after Jesus. Some of those traditions that are in the Talmud may have existed then, but they weren't written down until well after the diaspora, so that these, these viewpoints and laws and rules might go on and provide a foundation for Judaism when Israel was spread around the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So that is called the Talmud. But the Talmud had two parts, the Mishnah and the Gemara. And so the Mishnah was the commentary on the Torah, and then the Gemara was the commentary on the Mishnah, and then a thousand years later, Rashi, the great medieval rabbi Rashi, wrote his commentary on the Talmud. And today, every Torah will have Rashi's commentary included. Mm -hmm. So what you have is tradition upon tradition upon tradition upon tradition. Right. And today, when you speak to different Orthodox, and what I've noticed, and you may have, when you get to be my age, you notice a lot of things about the way that rabbinic Judaism has developed. But when I was growing up, there were, in our, in, I used to go to Brooklyn every year for the Jewish holidays. We didn't see any black hats. Mm. And when I was young, they came over, many of the ultra-Orthodox, the Chassidim, the Haredim came over after the war, and they were just a small, small remnant of the families that survived the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. So, but today they're in the hundreds of thousands. Right. And over time, so my family we knew Reform or Reform Conservative and Orthodox, and most of my relatives considered themselves Orthodox, but they wouldn't be considered Orthodox today. Right, because they kept kosher, but the kosher laws were pretty minimal. You didn't eat shellfish. You didn't, you know, you, and you didn't mix mix milk with meat, which is tradition, not law. It's right. not in the Torah. That has grown, 
to the point where many, many, many religious Jewish families have two entirely separate kitchens. Wow. Because that's what the traditions continue to grow. The rules continue to grow. If you, in a, in a faith that is dependent upon obedience to God and showing your devotion through the level of obedience, that just gets ratcheted up. So that even today, I hear about people that grew up in ultra-Orthodox homes that don't recognize it anymore because it's changed so much, hmm. even in the last 10 years. And wow. so I, I talk to people often about what go back to the Torah and see if it's there, including the reality that there's no mention of the oral, oral Torah at all in the Hebrew scriptures. In fact, the scriptures say everything that God told Moses, he wrote down. That's right. Everything that God told Moses, he wrote down. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, um, every time the, the Torah is mentioned, it, it's either directly referring to something that was written or referring to something back that was written. Um, so either direct reference or a... Exactly. Uh, to, yeah, exactly. To something that was written. The written Torah was the written Torah for all times. Yeah. Now, Talmud, it's not that it has expanded. Mm -hmm. I think that's the word that I will use. And what saddens me about that is not that everything in the Talmud is is not true. Much of it is beautiful. It adds quality to worship right. it, and understanding. But there's much of it that is not true. And that becomes really difficult. I remember for me, even when I became a believer, it took me probably three years of reading through the Bible every year before I could feel any level of confidence around what I thought was true. So, for example, I, like most Jewish people that I know growing up, we were all raised thinking that Abraham's father was an idol maker mm -hmm. and that Abraham in Revelation, that there was only one God, destroyed his father's idols and, and left the community. But that's not in the Torah. Mm -hmm. That's in the, in the rabbinic writings. And so many of the people that I know that grew up in Orthodox or ultra-Orthodox home have a lot of things that they believe is true mm -hmm. that is simply not there. And I'm constantly encouraging everybody that will listen to me <laughs> to go back to the Torah and see if you can find it, starting with whether there even is an oral law. Yeah. Yeah, and that's important. It's really important. Um, in, in some of my ministry here in Israel, I talk to a lot of people and those that are willing to talk to me. I, I don't, you know, there's no, I'm not dragging people down and, and saying, listen to me. I, you know, these are people that are willing to engage in, in conversation, respectful, loving conversation. And there's always the uh, argument of, well, Moses received the oral Torah and all of its uh, accompaniments as a legally binding uh, authority on Mount Sinai along with the written Torah. And they also say that, that we can't read the, the Hebrew scriptures or the Tanakh on our own, or even the, law, the, the, the Torah, the five books of Moses on our own and actually understand them. We have to have commentary and we have to have a rabbi explain them to us, which is it's one of the comments that I, I find most um, interesting is, hey, Jeff, why don't you, I think you need to go talk to a rabbi. And I just, I just say, why can't I just talk to you? You know, talk to me. You know, why do you think that I shouldn't believe in what I believe? Let's let's have a conversation, you know, and I think people should be able to express their faith and their belief on their own um, because God tells us to love him with our heart, soul and mind and strength that we need to study him and learn and read him. And, and so when we direct people towards the Torah, seek for yourself, where is the evidence of all of this oral tradition as an authority? that that is legally binding um you know obviously there was a uh, rabbinic tradition and some of it's beautiful exactly but you're right the question is authority who is the authority and i had two things i wanted to say based on what you were just saying one is that it always fascinated me that that when you teach somebody to identify a counterfeit bill you never show them a counterfeit bill you show them the real thing 
And if they learn the real thing well enough, they'll know a counterfeit the minute they see it. Mm. Uh, the other, which I think has slipped, about authority. In yeah. the, it's very interesting to me that one of the first things that young Jewish boys who read the Talmud learn is that Moses gave the Torah, gave the authority to Joshua, and he passed it down and down and down to the rabbis. And so even in the Talmud, it claims the rabbinic authority to the point where even in my studies of Rashi, I was amazed to study. When I was in seminary, I wrote a paper on Rashi, and I took as the Parsha that I read, the Parsha of the Golden Calf. Mm -hmm. And in reading the commentary, I thought, oh, this is really, really interesting because it seemed like it was pointing the finger to the mixed multitude and taking the, any responsibility away from Aaron. Mm. And I realized, of course, that would have to be the case because Aaron was the high priest. Right. If the high priest could do wrong, then how can you give authority to your rabbi? And how... Right. And so it accomplished these purposes. And I do understand the time period that Rashi was writing and the fear That's of right. Christian testimony and all of those purposes. So I don't I don't necessarily fault him for doing it, though I do fault the untruth that it contains. Right. To be cautious of Gentiles, particularly Christians, mm -hmm. and to always trust your rabbis, because they're not always right. No one is, just Jesus. Yeah, and right. And like you said earlier, um, look in the Tanakh and you'll see the horrible waywardness of the of the high priests even. Totally. You know, I mean, how do you how do you maintain this pristine oral tradition and oral binding um authority throughout the centuries of of um uh Galut, um when the when the people were taken into exile. Yep. And uh and the waywardness of the high priests and the people and and how they worship the idols of the of the nations surrounding them continuously and this is what we read about we don't read about this pristine oral tradition being handed down generation to generation and like you said only 200 to 500 years after um jesus was was walking on on the earth do we finally see something showed up showing up about mm -hmm. this oral tradition and its legally binding authority and in that oral tradition, the other thing that, that has always been interesting to me is a story that um, they read in, in the Talmud about an oven, proclaiming whether this oven was kosher or not. Right. And this one out of the group was the only one that proclaimed it one way. And it was there that they proclaimed that the majority was right. And I Instead thought, of that's interesting to me. When Instead of the word of God. Right. <laughs> right. Instead of the when, word of God. Yeah. It, it, well, even just in Jewish history, was the majority right when the 12 spies went in to see the land? No, it was the two. It is not the majority. The majority right. can lead us astray. Right. And so right. putting our faith in the word of God and testing, even as believers in Jesus, when we hear teachings from different individuals, go back and test it. Right. See if it's really in the Torah, in the Gospels, in the New and Testament. Where that's is right. it? The New, the New Testament actually tells us to do that. Exactly. Which I think, yeah, which I think speaks um, in a positive note about the New Testament itself. Um, you know, yeah, study us, study it. Uh, you know, God is not worried that you're going to, uh, uh, he's going to be disproven through his word. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Well, this has been wonderful. Um, any final uh, comments you'd like to close out with as we uh, wrap up this uh, final segment? The only thing I would say is if you're if you're searching, keep searching. Don't give up. And if we can help, let us. Yep. Yeah, we're here. We're here for you. Thank you so much, Carol Joseph. Really appreciate you being here. Thanks. Thank you for joining us in the Conversations with Jewish Believers in Jesus podcast. You can find many more fascinating episodes here on the channel. To find out more about Carol and her work, click on the link below in the description. To find out more about Jews for Jesus, you can visit us and even chat with us anonymously at our website, 
jewsforjesus.org. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. And may you all find peace and hope in our Messiah, Yeshua.